So tonight, we're going to talk about sourcing records that aren't found at Family Search. As we know a lot about doing records that are at Family Search, but then the question comes up, what do we do about things when they're not at Family Search? But we really need to kind of talk about sourcing in general and then maybe spend a minute with Family Search sources before we get into the topic directly that we're going to talk about today. Sourcing is essential. It is the most important thing we do over in TREE because this is how we can prove that people existed. It helps us to connect people into their family and to, to add new people into the family as we find sources because most sources name multiple people. And by finding many sources and families, we add in all the people eventually, we hope. Also, it provides the dates and places for the people's vital records so that we can identify them uniquely. And we need to do all the sources at Family Search. We need to source everything that's found there. Now, you know, I know we're talking about outside there today, but we still need to remember that we need to try to do every source that we can that's found at Family Search. A, they're easy to attach. It's the easiest way to attach sources are the ones that are at Family Search. So it's not a, a cumbersome or tedious job. And these provide all that information that we need and all the relationships. And by sourcing all the records at Family Search, you use up all the potential sources that other people could come along and find and then create new records to attach these sources to somebody that might not know the family as well as you. And so by finding all the sources on people in Family Search, you help to eliminate the potential for duplication. And so that really is important. But of course, eventually the point of time comes that we've used up everything at Family Search. And by far, we need to realize that Family Search doesn't have everything. There are many other sources, many places where we can go to find records and documents outside Family Search and even books and other things like that in libraries or private collections, other websites. And these can all be sourced to our people that are in the tree at Family Search. And there's, there's about four different ways that we can do this. And we're gonna go through those different ways today. And the thing to understand is that any record found outside Family Search, regardless of whether it's digital or paper, whether it's online or in a library or an archive or in your closet in a box, it can be sourced. And these records often provide new additional information that we would never get if we just stuck to just Family Search sources. And so they're valuable to us also. They help us add new people to tree and add extra information to all the people that are in there. And if your record's not found at Family Search, you're going to need to either manually create the doc the source document, or you're going to need to use some automated program to create the source. And we're going to go through the different options that you have. I actually go through four different things that you can do to get records into sources for family search when we're outside family search. Okay, so the first thing we need to learn though is we've got to learn the parts of the source program that we have, all the different fields that are in a source so that we know what we've got to fill out. And so what we'll do is we'll go over into tree and we'll pull up a source is what we're going to end up doing. Now, Tree has begun to change a little bit. I'm showing you the new version of the person page. Things have been moved around, but everything that we need is pretty much where it used to be. The source 
link is right there where the red arrow is pointing. And to get in to see the sources, we click on that. And that pulls up some sources at the bottom. And then to get more information on uh, any, you know, to create a new source, what we're going to do is we're going to click add a source. There's actually a three item drop down. We're just going to click on add a new source from that drop down. And what it brings up is a um, template for sources. Now, the one you're going to see is a little different than this. This is actually the old version, but I kept it because I can get everything on one screen. What they've done with the new version of this source template is they've squeezed it together so it's narrower. The boxes are deeper and you therefore have to scroll through, but everything's identical. All the fields have got the same names and everything. The actually, the only change in it is found down here where we have these, what they call now tags for different events in the person's life. And on this, you would click the little boxes in front of the things. If this source had the person's name, you'd click name. If it had his birth, you'd click birth. If it had death, you'd click death. Now, instead of the little boxes, each word is in a bubble and you just click on the bubble, but it's all the same. So it, it, I like this because I can show you the whole source on a single page and not have to do a double page or two columns or something like that. So the parts of your source are these things. You have a title and you need to give a title to the source or they won't let you create it. And so that's essential. I like to include names, that's not required, but to me, to, that's essential. I like to start the source out with the name of the main person that is in the source. Then you, if it has a URL, you know, a web link, you add that in, or if it's coming from a memory, you click on add memory and you link up the memory that the source is being made from. And we'll show you what we're talking about in a minute. Sometimes that can just be left blank. If you don't have a memory and it's not on a web page, you can just skip over it. The next thing is where this record is found. Now that's where the source actually is located. And, and the answer should not be familysearch.org or ancestry.com because these are websites that collect sources from other places. You want the actual location, like in this case, they're showing you the United Kingdom 1841 census and telling you about the origin for that. And it's in the federal archives over there. It may be showing at Ancestry or Find My Past, but it's actually not. You don't want to put Find My Past on there. You want to say where the thing really came from, the archive or the book or whatever the thing might be. Then there's a place for describing the record or notes. I think of this as the transcription. Here's where you can transcribe the important data and put it in that box so people will know what it says in that document about their ancestor or relative without having to actually go to it. So they get a sneak peek at what's there. And so this is usually reserved for your notes about this particular document. Then you have a reason statement for why you're offering it. And this is good because sometimes the, the source might be incorrect or misleading. And so it, this is where you can say that the wife was named Mary Jones, but Jones was not her maiden name. That was her married name from a prior marriage or something like that. Along with the obvious things you would say that this is a record of Mary Jones and Samuel Smith's marriage and that it agrees with the dates that we already know about their marriage, or things like that. Then you tag what you can for the people's, uh, the, or the person in this case, so you're doing it for one person at a time, for the person's vital records that are mentioned in the document. 
And marriages are tricky because there's no place to click marriage. And so all you can go with is name, birth, death, sex, christening, and burial. Those are the six items that you can link this source to. And then there's a chance here for you to check to put this in my source box. What I recommend is that anytime you have a source that you're making up from scratch, like we would be doing here, you want to put that in your source box so you don't lose it. If it's just a source that you're getting from some record and family search, there's really no big need for you saving that in your source box, to be honest with you, because you can just go to the records at family search and pull it back up if you need to. But when you're making something from scratch, something that's unique, it is good to keep a record of those in your source box. And then at the end, you click save and the save button will be colored. It won't be grayed out once you fill in everything or at least the things they require. Okay, so let's actually do a source. In this case, we'll do a, we'll use an image of a record. This is my grandparents' actual marriage license from 1907 in the territory of Arizona. So the first thing I did was digitize it. That's why you're able to see it on the screen. And then I added it to family search as a memory. So we're going to make a source from a memory. That's what we're going to do this time. And now that I've got it in memories, I'm ready to get started. So this is what it looks like over in memories now. I've given it a title so it can be identified. I've tagged it to my grandparents. I put a date on there for it, the date of the marriage and the event location, Globe, Gila County, Arizona territory. And so I'm ready to go. Okay. So I go over to my grandfather in this case, and I, I go down to his sources. I clicked on sources and I say, add a source. And I'm gonna create it myself. So the first thing I do is I go give it a title. You notice I put their names in there. Normally put their names in the way it's spelled and written out in the document. And I didn't follow that with this, or it would have said J.C. Givens and Krista Wilkins. I forgot and I typed in Joseph Craig. I could always go back and edit this and change it to JC. It's coming from a memory. So instead of having the URL link, I'll click over on add a memory. And then since I've already put it in uh, my memories, I'll just say select it from the gallery. And when I do that, the whole gallery comes up. I can do a search since I know I had the word Givens in the title. I just type Givens to you know, make the list smaller. Or I knew it was a document. I could have just clicked on the document icon. Either way, I found this image and I clicked on the little circle up in the upper corner, turned it blue. That lets me know that it's gonna go put this particular memory in the source that I'm working on right now. So then I click attach and there it goes. It actually physically gets placed in this memory or in this source. Okay, so the next thing we need is a citation. And you know, the citations, where is it found? Well, I know it's in my, my possession, it's here in the room I'm in, but that's not what I want. So I filled in the original repository is the clerk of the Superior Court for Gila County, Arizona, because that's what the wiki said is where the marriage licenses at that time were found. The interesting thing was, and I put that in here so that people would know, this marriage does not appear in the index for these records, the index that was put out by the county clerk. They somehow missed this. And then I put one more sentence and said, this actual document is in the possession of their grandson, Robert Givens. Okay, so that's my citation for this. Then describe the record. I went through and did a transcription. 
And I wrote out, you know, about the date of it and that J.C. Givens and Krista Wilkins were united in marriage and globe. And then it was done in the presence of P. Wilkins, Emma Wilkins and Lottie Wilkins. And then for the reason to attach the source, I said, this is the documentary proof that Krista and Joe got married in Globe on the 25th of September, 1907. And then I add a little parenthetical comment in here because I know a little bit about who these people are and everything. It's interesting that the witnesses were Parley Wilkins, that's P. Wilkins, which is Krista's brother and his wife, Emma, and her younger sister, Lottie, who's not there, or at least was not listed as a witness, was Krista's mother, Charlotte, who might not have been there. And that leads us to thinking that she wasn't thoroughly 100% thrilled that her little daughter was marrying this gold miner, even though she did seem to like Joe Givens. She, I don't think, liked him as much as a son-in-law as she did a boarder in her boarding house. But that's neither her nor there. So I added a little extra in there. And then I, the only thing you can check is name because there's no dates in here or anything like that. Uh, Janet, you raised your hand. I don't usually take questions in the middle, but I'll take it. Oh, I'm sorry to bother you. I just wondered if there was a way to copy your screen so that I, because I can't keep up on taking notes. And I oh, just Oh, this wondered... is fine. Uh, if you're one of our new people that have been here before, later tonight, you're going to receive a link to the recording for this meeting. And you will also get a link to a PDF file that will show each of these slides. Perfect. And Thank you can you so download much. it and go through it at your leisure. Thank you. And I'm so sorry to have interrupted yeah, you. No problem. Thank no you. No problem. I should have mentioned that because we get new people all the time. And I didn't even think about it. Okay. So I, I tagged the only thing I can tag, which is their names. And I made sure it was going to go to my source box and I click save. Okay. And here's my finished source. This is what it looks like. It looks really nice. That's a lot of work. I had to do a lot of typing to get all this done. And I had to go, you know, digitize the source and everything. So that was a lot of work. Okay. Now, let's do one that won't take quite as much work. But it's still, I'm going to be doing this manually. I found this record at another location out on the web. I found it in BYU Idaho's uh, genealogy collections in a collection called the Western States Marriage Record Index. These guys were so kind to go down there to the courthouse in, in Globe and make an index of all the marriage records down there. And they found my grandparents' marriage record because it's in their index. It's not in the county's index, but it's in BYU Idaho's index. So I actually do have online at a different website, the index for this record, same record. And so I'm going to make another um, source for it using this as my source. So I'm still going to be having to do this manually at this point. So what I did is I went through and I gave the source a name, marriage of Joseph Craig Givens and Krista Wilkins. I give you the URL because that other page had a URL. So I can put that in the source. I give a transcription or not a transcription. I give a record of where it's at, a citation that is at the BYU Idaho Online West Western States Marriage Index. But the original license should be at the Gila County Arizona Superior Court. And then I did a transcription. I did a copy and paste of that transcription that was on that page. I just ran my mouse over these things, got them highlighted and then did a copy and then pasted that into this box so that people will know the main things that were in that transcription. And then for the reason for this is I say, this is an index for my grandparents' marriage. And it agrees with the original document that's in my possession. And again, the only thing that's 
listed on here that I can tag, whoops, is the name. And I want this to go to my source box and I want to save it. Okay, so that's a couple of different sources where I've actually gone and um, manually source something. I'm trying to get our thing off of there. There we go. So now it's time to uh, actually show you how you can do this easier because there is an easier way. And it's one of the two automated processes that I'm going to show you. We have an excellent little tool called Record Seek that was written just for this purpose. And Record Seek's a third party product. In other words, somebody outside Family Search made it. And it allows us to take any website, any web page in the world, and turn it into a source. Okay, it'll work with most browsers. It used to only work with Chrome, but now it works with most of the browsers. You have to install it on the browser of the computer you are using. And I can't stress that enough. Like I use Chrome pretty much exclusively. Once in a while, I'll turn Edge on, but 99.9% .9 of the time it's Chrome. So I can, and I can load this, I can install RecordSeq on my Chrome browser that's on my computer, and then I can use it. But if I go over to say my wife's computer and I sign in as me on my wife's computer in Chrome, I'm not gonna have it there unless I've installed it on her machine too. So even though you're installing it on a browser, it doesn't go with the browser. It's installed on the computer and then used by the browser that's on that computer. So you have to understand that, that you really, if you go to a new machine, you're gonna probably have to download it again. You're gonna see it's very simple to do because the installation is just simply drag and drop. You can't find anything easier to install than this. Okay, once you've got it installed, you'll be able to go to any web page and create a source from that page and make a source document for it. And RecordSeq will fill in all the boxes for you. We won't be having to type all these things in. And you can create the source for one of two places. You can either put the source in Family Search or put it in Ancestry. There is a limit there. It only works for those two websites. If you wanna do this for Find My Past or uh, My Heritage or some other website, it's not gonna work. Or your uh, Roots Magic or something like that. It, the source it creates will be able to be dropped into either Family Search or Ancestry. But that's the only two places. So that's the one limit. So a couple of tips. As you're using it, the first thing you're going to want to do is copy the ID of the person that you're going to be attaching the source to before you get started. Because sooner or later, you're going to have to do that. And you're going to have to provide that ID. And so do it right away. And don't worry that you're copying it because you're not going to erase that copy because there's nothing else you're going to want to copy. So copy the ID and you're ready to roll. The ID of the person who's going to be the recipient of this source. Then it works best in my estimation if you source the transcription page that the document is attached to, not the actual document if it has an image of the document, but that transcription page you go to first because that transcription page shows you all the basic information that the indexers have taken off of that document and the people can see that. And then they can click on the document and see if it agrees. And I think the more logical approach to do it that way. So I source the transcription page, not the actual image, unless there is no transcription page. And then the other thing you're going to find is that if you highlight the transcription, the text that you want to have placed in the notes portion of the source that RecordSeq is going to create, it'll put it right there for you. 
but you have to highlight what you want. And we'll be showing you all that. So here's where we start. We've got to get it on our computer. So you just go to recordseek.com and then on this page, it shows you a uh, by images, all the different uh, browsers that you can uh, attach RecordSeq to as an extension. They're called browser extensions. And then what you're actually going to do is you're going to go down here where this little box is, this little green box, and you're going to put your mouse on it and you're going to drag it up here to, in this case, the bookmark bar and just drop it there. This bar might be called the, the favorites bar in some browsers. The big thing is you need a, uh, you need to have this open. Sometimes in your browser, you don't have that showing. You have to go up where the little three dots are and set it so that it shows so that you have a place to drop it. And by dropping it in there, it will install automatically. And you're done with the installation. That's all there is to it. Nothing else to click on. OK, now let's go actually do a source by turning a web page into a source. And remember, we're going to copy the ID first. So before any of this happens, I go over and copy the ID for the person. Because sooner or later, I have to provide this. If I don't copy the ID, I'm going to have to search in tree to find the person. And I don't want to spend time doing that. It's a lot easier just to provide them with the ID. And I know for sure where it's going. They've got the right person out of tree. So I navigate to the page I want to go to, highlight the text that I want put into notes. I click on the little record seek button or I find record seek in my bookmarks and click on it. If this is the first time I've used it in this session, I'm going to have to sign in. In this case, sign into Family Search because I want to put it at Family Search, and then just follow the directions. Follow the steps, and I'll be done. So we'll take you through that. So we'll go back here to our good old page from BYU Idaho and show you how to make an alternate source from this page. I've copied the ID from my grandfather, and I have drag I've dragged my mouse over this part of the page so it got highlighted. I don't want to copy it. I don't have to type copy. I just highlight it and that's all. Now that it's highlighted, I need to go turn on record seek. And I have a couple of different ways I can go up. And if I only have a couple of extensions, I'll see the record seek extension button up here, just opposite my URL bar. If I have too many of them, there'll just be an icon there for all extensions. And I put my mouse on that and a drop down occurs and you'll find record seek in the list. The other way to do it is to go over there at the end of your favorites bar or your, your um, and my mind shot, your um, Uh -huh. Well, your favorites bar, bookmarks, and click on the little two arrow thing, and that will bring down the whole list. And then you can find record seek in there. <coughs> if you've got my browser, you do not want to go that way because I have two or 300 things bookmarked, and you'll never find it. So I just go find the little icon and click on it. As soon as you click on that icon, a pop-up appears and it says, okay, we're gonna create a source, goody, let's go to it. But first we wanna know, do you wanna put it in Family Search or Ancestry? So we're gonna click on Family Search and then it's gonna sign me in. I'm gonna to have to sign in. Once I'm signed in, then a new pop-up appears. And this is the incorrect page, but I'm gonna show it to you because I'd say 20% of the time, this is the page that pops up first. And it's not the page you want first, it's the page you want second. So if you happen to see the page right away that says, you know, give us the name of the person or their ID number, 
you don't want to see that yet. You want to see if they created the source OK. So what you're going to do is just go over here to modify source and go back a page. And this is what the page should look like. OK. And there's a couple of things you want to check and possibly change. The first thing is you want to see if those notes are there. Because once in a great while, it creates the source. And for whatever reason, sometimes because there's operator error and the operator forgot to highlight what he wanted to show. So it would fill in. Or sometimes it doesn't fill it in for you for some dumb reason. So you want to look and see if you've got your transcription there. If you don't, just close it and start over and do it again. And the next time I guarantee you it'll, it'll show up. The other thing is you're going to want to edit the title and get your names in there. So this time I got the names the right way, JC Givens and Krista Wilkins. Okay. And so now that you know that's okay, the third thing you can do is you can go up here and you can tag those events, the name, sex, birth, christening, death, burial, whatever appears in this record, which would be names. Actually, you could probably put sex too because it says groom and bride, so you know their genders. Okay, now that you've got all that done, now you can click next and it takes you to the page where you go searching for your person. So you don't wanna fill in all those boxes. All you wanna do is in this incredibly large box, paste that incredibly small seven character uh, ID number. I don't know why they made the big box that big, but uh, whatever reason, you can't miss it because it's the huge box down at the bottom. So you put the ID in for the person and you click next and it takes you to the final page, the third and final page on this. And you can see who you're attaching this to because it'll say up here, if that's not the right person, click go back and get the right ID number so that you get it attached to the right person. If you forgot about the tags, you can click tag this event now because they're giving you one more chance and you can put a reason in here. Okay. And so I've done all those things. I've got my reason. Now I'm ready to attach. And this is the screen they give you after it's done. So it's, congratulations, you've attached that source. And guarantee you, it takes a lot less time than we're taking right now. That's for sure. Okay. Now we have two things on here we can do. We could click view profile on family search. And what it's going to do is open up a new window or a new tab. And you're going to have two for that person now to see that they've had this thing attached to them. Or the other thing you, and I don't usually ever do that. I usually just X this out, go back to the page that I already had open on this person, refresh it, and then check the memories or check the sources to make sure they've got it. Now, there is one thing though that is important. If you have two people, like I have two people here, I want to click attach to another person and it goes back to that page where you pick a person to attach it to and I'll put my grandmother's ID in there and then attach it to her. And it's easier to do this right now than any other time. So attach it to all the people that need it be attached and you're done. Okay, when it's done and you go back to the person, you go to their sources, this is kind of what the list is going to look like. And here's the one we just made. And it has a little world icon. That tells you it was made from a source outside family search. In fact, with these three sources, you see the three different icons that could be there. This icon right below it is a memories icon. So I know that this source is made from a memory. And the bottom one's the little family search tree. So I know the 1880 census for Joseph Givens came from family search. So that's what the little icons stand for. And any of these that you make, 
show this icon. Now, this is a lot easier to do. I did a lot of talking, but this can be done within a minute or a minute and a half. It doesn't take very long to make one of these, as long as everything is running smoothly. Okay, now there is another way you can do an automated source record. This one, though, is limited strictly to members of the LDS Church, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because it only works from your tree, if you have a tree at Ancestry, to the tree at Family Search. And it only works for LDS members who have an account at Ancestry that is set up through their church membership record. And so I have that. And so over in Ancestry, I'm working on this guy, Ruben Bunn Reef Snyder, and I'm gonna be able to sync or match up this record with a record for him over in Family Search if there is one. And if there is, I can then swap data either direction. I can swap information like about their name and birth and death or sources. And I can do these with single clicks if I'm careful and I know what I'm doing. So let's try this out. I'll know if my account will do this if next to search, you have a little circle with a tree, the family search tree in it. That tells you right there that this is a, an account that's linked through fam, to family search through a member's account, a member of the church's account. And right now it only has the tree and that tells me I have not tried to connect this Reuben with the Reuben over in family search. So the first thing I wanna do is click on that. When I clicked on it, this big box, which usually would have possible names to go from, had a message in here. He is not, there is no record for this person found in family search. That's what it originally said. Is that this was clicked here that said find best match. I had to change it over to find a match in family search because I knew he was in there. And I went and looked up the ID for the person. I pasted the ID in here and then said, find a match. And then his name popped up here. But this is one where even this system here, which is more generous than family search, was unable to find the duplicate record, the record of the same person over in tree. And we'll talk about that in a second here. Okay, so I click on that little bubble because this is the guy I wanna pair my ancestry person up with. And so in the red box is what is found about this Reuben Reef Snyder. You'll notice he has a month and year for birth, no death, no spouse. And his name does not have a middle name. It just has a first and last name. And it's comparing it with the person I have in my ancestry tree that I'm trying to connect to. And so I noticed an ancestry tree, I've been able to add the middle name, full birth date, full birthplace, full death date, full death place. And I've got the starts of a spouse. I've got the spouse's first and middle initial, and I've got the spouse's year of birth. Now there's a lot of differences between those two records. And that's why it said initially that there, the guy wasn't there, that they couldn't find this Reuben Bunn Reef Snyder because these two records were too much different, even though they have the same parents' names. Now, if I had not known about this record here, I would have gone ahead and just clicked Add to Family Search, and it would have put my record that I created in Ancestry over in Family Search, but I know that would have been a duplicate. And so rather than put a duplicate in there, I took the extra time to go find them. This is unusual. Usually they find your person for you, unless you're working a line that nobody's ever researched before. Okay, that's the first step is just matching the two people up or linking them or syncing them, whatever you want to call it. 
once you've done that and you go back into your tree at ancestry, you no longer have just that little circle with the tree symbol. You'll have the symbol for the tree and then another symbol, which is actually an ordinance symbol. In this case, it's telling us that all of his ordinances have been reserved and are in progress or completed. There's some in progress at this point. Now, when I click on here, I can then go to ordinances if I want to see the ordinance details, or I can do compare person, compare with the person in family search, which is what I want to do. But I could also go straight over to family search to this person and see them. Or if I didn't have the rest of the family members for Reuben and family search had them, I could go down here to add relatives from family search and one by one add them into my tree at ancestry. Now I can't do that in this location from ancestry in the family search, but you saw that if I click on a person in my tree and they don't show up as a possible match with somebody that I can then add them into tree. So it can be done there. And then there's the disconnect. And you need that because what happens is if somebody merges this Reuben Bun Reef Snyder with another Reuben Reef Snyder, and this guy becomes the deleted record, I'll no longer be able to connect because it will not transfer the match over to a new ID. I've got to come in here and disconnect this match and then go up here and do it again and get a match to the new record that was merged, the result of the merge. So anyway, what I want to do is I want to go up here, click on this and then do compare. And this is where it really gets cool because I have here uh, on one side family search, on the left, on the right, I have ancestry. And I can swap things either direction. So in this case, Family Search originally just had Reuben Reef Snyder. Ancestry said his name was Reuben Bunn Reef Snyder. So I want to put the full name over in Family Search. And so what I do is I click on the little box and it turns green with a check mark and the name gets moved over there. And when I'm finished and I say save, it's going to update family search. Now, it's going to also ask me to give some reasons for this. So I'm saying, okay, I got this information from his death certificate and from find a grave where the middle name was named both times. And so I put that in there. Now, as I go on down the page, I'll also come to sources and I can move them around also. So I'm down here with just a portion of the sources. And in this case, on the ancestry side, I have his death certificate from Pennsylvania. I know that's a record that's not at family search. And so what I'm going to do is click on that little box and move that source over into family search. And that's all I have to do to get that source over to family search. It's just click the button. And when I'm done and I say save, he's going to have that source. Now there's two more sources on this screen. Yeah, I've got, you know, 1900 uh, census and I've got the 1880 census. I don't want to move those over because those should be at family search. And you, if they're at family search, you should source them from family search, not bring them over from ancestry or some other site. So I'll leave those alone, but I will bring over the death certificate because I know it's not there. Okay, now there's one thing I do though. Once I bring a source over, I go look at it because this is the way the, the source initially looked and it doesn't have the names up here. So I should go in there and add names. And then down here in the uh, record or the notes, there's nothing listed. So I should go back to Ancestry, copy the transcription, paste it in there so it looks better. Otherwise, the notes are kind of a blank note. 
and people would have to go over there if they have an ancestry account and you know go to this record the thing is a lot of people don't have an ancestry account that do family search so if i can put the transcription down here at least they can see what the transcription was okay when i'm done this is what it looks like the name's been added to the, the source and i've added the transcription i put a note in there saying i added the, that information and then i save it okay pictures let's just talk about those for a second <clears throat> now this first paragraph is the law and we're not going to debate it we'll just say it unless you own a copyright to an image or have a license from the owner printing a copy of an image or posting it online without permission is a violation of copyright if that image is under copyright it's up to the copyright holder to decide whether to sue you for infringement or not okay now that being said uh, the question is will this be enforced online and most likely it isn't but you need to be aware of your legality or illegality of what you're doing at least be honest about what's going on here if you copy a picture for your private use no one's ever going to probably notice and you're not going to have any problems but once you post something online on the internet then there's always a possibility for problems and usually the worst thing that'll happen is you're going to get a nasty letter from a person that says take this down or i'm going to sue you and you'll have to take it down that's about the worst it could get but i just want you to understand that the hard part is somebody posts something online the hard part is do you are they actually the copyright owner or not you know there's always those issues too but it's always good to understand when you're doing this there's always a chance you're going to get yourself in a little hot water i've never had it happen yet i've had friends that have so i know it can happen Okay, so let's talk a little bit about images from the internet. Pictures on the web are usually what they call dumbed down. They're not the highest quality. They're dumbed down so they can be viewed on a monitor and loaded rapidly. And you can think about it by thinking about the images of the tombstones that find a grave, because that's some place that all of us probably go to at one time or another. Okay. And when we're saying copy an image, usually what we really are meaning is downloading the image. So let's let's go through this and I'll show you a suggestion. Here's a find a great page for one of my great uncles. And uh, Kenny, uh, this is his headstone. Notice the picture was taken supposedly by Nancy Newman. Nancy Newman posted it doesn't really mean Nancy Newman had to take it, but you would assume Nancy Newman probably took it. So that's just on the legal side of things, you need to remember that. I would not copy this image. I could do a right click on it and say copy image, but this is going to be the dumbed down image. It's going to be the least clear image that there is of this. I know that if I click on that image, it's going to give me a better view. So I click on it and I get a better view. But I also notice down here, there's a thing that says view original and I'll get an even better image if I view the original. So there's my original image and that's the one I want. And so what I'll do is I'll do a right click on it and I'll choose save image as. And then that opens up a dialog box I like to save things on my desktop to start with because then I can find the darn things to begin with and then I'll go put them where I need to put them from there. And I'm going to put it on the desktop and I'm going to name it uh, H. Kenneth Heimbaugh Senior Headstone because that's what it is and save it. And then I can go put it over in memories and I can create a source that's linked to it or I can just leave it as a memory in family search. Okay, now if it's over in memories, this is what'll happen when it first goes there. As we know from the other month or two ago when we did memories, it's gonna have a processing 
situation here. As soon as it's through being processed, you'll be able to see it clear. You can see I put a title, I connected it to people. I put the event date, meaning the date that he died, which was 1994. And this place that he's buried, Lewisburg Union County, Pennsylvania, and the Lewisburg Cemetery. Now, what I failed to do is I should have put in here that this image was taken by Nancy Newman and posted at Find a Grave. And so I needed to go back in there later and add that in there. That's what I do to try to appease people. If I know who posted it, I'll list them there, give them credit, and usually they're happy. Most of the problems I've seen are people that said, you know, if you had just given me credit, I wouldn't be upset. And so that's what I would do. Okay, now you can actually take pictures right off the screen. And so you can use what they call snipping tools. Just think of scissors snipping. The most common ones I use here from view, and it's a free program, it's a little tricky. There's a thing called snipping tool, which is part of Windows. So if you have a Windows machine, it's right there and it's a free product. Snag, it's another very popular one. It has a free version and a paid version that does some extra things. And then I listed a bunch of others. So I thought I'd show you just a little bit about how these work. These allow you to take a portion of a screen and capture that portion of a screen and turn it into an image, whether it's a picture or an article or whatever. So in this case, I've got my great grandfather's um, obituary, John Hale, out of the Lebanon newspaper from the 2nd of April, 1941. And I want to turn that into a picture. So I'm going to use the snipping tool that comes with Windows even though I don't usually use it. And so what I do to get this working is the snipping tool will turn on if I press the Windows key and hold it down, Shift and hold it down and S. And when I do that, the whole screen turns dark and this little menu bar shows up up here. And when that menu bar shows up, it also puts a little white cross on my screen and then I can take that white cross and drag it, I can move it around wherever I want it to be. And then I can drag it, whoops, diagonally through the shape and it will outline the shape of what I want. I gotta be careful when I'm playing with this on my screen. And so once I've done that, it will then snip out that article. So I highlighted that article and when I let go, it immediately copied that little article to the clipboard. And then I clicked on select here to mark and share the image. Okay, because it's on my clipboard right now, just like anything else that you copy. And so when I click on that, I get this big menu item here, or this big menu screen with my article in the middle. And the main thing I'm after here is I just want to save this. And so I'll click on saving it and I'll save it to my desktop. And so then I've got that article. So that's how you snip parts of pages. You can do anything. You can do articles like this, or you can find an article on, on your person in, you know, on some web page and copy it or an image of something that you want and copy it. Now, as I was doing all this, one last thing and I'm finished, I discovered something in Google that I never knew about. I've got a lot of pictures of my grandfather that my grandfather took and he died in 1925. So these are all pictures from prior to 1925. And I don't know where they are. I don't know where they came from. You know, what, what did he take pictures of? And I discovered while I was doing this presentation that in Google Images, if you go to Google and then Images, there's a little camera here and that's called Google Lens. And that is a cool feature because when you click on it, you get this little screen here and you can drag or drop a picture of any place, anything, buildings or landscapes or, you know, whatever. And 
they will try to match it up with where that is in the world. I've been trying it out on the places I visited on our trip to Europe that I didn't name. And I, it tells me every time what that building is nor what that bridge is. I know what town we were in because I've organized them that way, but I don't know the names of the specific places. And it'll tell me the name of the church or the archive or the bridge or whatever. So I took one of my grandfather's pictures, this great you know, black and white picture. I thought it was in Pennsylvania somewhere. Love that old truck that's sitting there in front of it. And I said, I wonder where this place is. Well, lo and behold, here's a postcard and it's the same building. There's no question in my mind that is the same building. And it turns out this is the Gonzalez Alvarez house in St. Augustine, Florida. So my grandfather had been down to Florida sometime at some point. And it's the oldest house in America. And so that's why he had taken that picture. And so I went through several of his pictures with places that I couldn't recognize. And I was able on every single one of them to find out where that location was, what that picture was all about. It's really cool. He did like the, the um, oh, what do you call it? The mint, the Washington mint. He was an accountant. So money meant things to him. So he took a picture of the Washington meant back in 1920 something and sure enough it showed up with its new name so this is just next a little thing i threw in so any questions from today i'll turn it over to you i will turn off the recording uh, bob 